This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And if you could, please do me a favor and take a moment and leave a rating and review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Heart Radio. doesn't matter. I'd greatly appreciate it, and that feedback really helps get other listeners to the show. Also, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to agutor.com slash tip and donate to the show. Thanks so much. All right, Geek Leaders, today I'm honored to have Landon Lovell on the show. He is uh, a um, financial professional. We're going to be talking about you know planning for our future and things like that. He's a partner at KB Financial Advisors, which um, you know they help people with maximizing their stock options and returns for tech employees, and have been since 2024 or 2014, which is uh, uh, about ten years ten years now. Wow, uh, Landon, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. Yeah, if you mind, just tell the audience a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to where you are today and why you got into uh, financial advising. Sure. So, um, you know, becoming a financial advisor is a bit of a career change for me. And so, um, you know, I've always had a love for the outdoors. And even now, my favorite, you know, way, favorite thing to do in my free time is to spend time you know, outdoors doing something active. So initially in college, that was kind of my career plan was to go into natural resources management. And I spent three years working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service managing national wildlife refuges in Mississippi, which was a was a great job. It was all about wintering waterfowl. So all summer long, we were preparing for the ducks to fly south, and then all winter we were making sure that they had everything that they needed while they were with us. But in that career, you know, and as kind of life changes from from college into adulthood, I just started looking and thinking about what my goals were and realizing that in order for me to meet some of my financial goals, um, you know, I was probably going to end up sitting in a cubicle in Atlanta or D.C. And and so, you know, more of the things that I didn't like about that job and none of the things that I loved. So I decided to make a career change, and that was to become a certified financial planner and started that in 2008. Okay. And whenever you go to that, that you know, what, what makes a certified financial planner, like, you, you know, certified, I guess you would say. Yeah. So it, it's a, um, and it, there's an education requirement in addition to a bachelor's degree and then passing the certified financial planner exam, you have to have the education requirements, um, which it's changed now. But when I went through it, it was six courses that cover kind of the key um, parts of a of a financial plan and um, you have to kind of take and pass all of those courses and then you can sit for the exam and once you pass the exam you then have a a certain number of years that you have to work before you can use the the designation and um so the certified financial planner, that designation is regulated by the the CFP board and they're a really great organization, um, you know, and there are kind of a lot of requirements that go into being able to use that designation that all relate back to if we're going to do a financial plan for somebody, what are the the key components, the parts that absolutely must be um, within that plan. Hmm. So if I've never done any kind of financial planning and, uh, yeah, I've got a full-time job making decent money. Maybe I have a 401k that I was auto enrolled in putting away, maybe let's say 3% or whatever the standard is that, that happens these days. What should I be doing? Yeah. Your 401k is kind of the first one. And so, um, you know, when I'm working with, you know, a, a tech employee, a busy professional. The, the approach that I take to financial planning is to 
is to try and make the complex simple. And usually when someone reaches out and says, you know, I'd like to talk and that's how it starts is just with that first conversation. You know, I'm usually talking to someone that's super busy at work and then they've, you know, outside of their professional life, they're probably busy also in their personal life. And there's a really good chance that this is a conversation that they have wanted to have for a long time. So the impression I get is that nobody wakes up, you know, this morning, lands on my website and sets up a call. Usually they've thought about working with an advisor for a while and then something's happened that's kind of given them, you know, the, the, the momentum to action to reach out. And so when we get on that phone call, there's usually all this stuff that's just kind of circling in their head mm-hmm. and their thoughts are just going round and around. You know, I want to do this. And what about, you know, I've got a question about this and then I really feel like I should. And, and I just let them talk. And then from there, you know, the way I start to address kind of that busyness that's, that's going on in their head is to say, okay, here's what's most important for you right now. And to get back to the 401k, you know, a lot of times that's one of the first things that we'll start with, even if it's not something that they ask about, we're going to, um, you know, to go through our planning process, which will include a a tax projection. And so as part of that, we're going to request their pay stub. And one of the first things we'll do with that pay stub is look and see how much they're contributing to their 401k. And if they're not maxing it out, then we're going to want to get them on a path to maxing out. Sometimes they're not maxing out because you know, they got the 401k when they started working there. That was three or four years ago, and they just haven't done anything with it since then and didn't give a lot of thought to it when they started that new job. And so sometimes it's super easy. We just, you know, increase the contribution and start them maxing out. Other times, you know, maybe um, they've got a lot of things that they really need, you know, their salary for right now, and there's not a lot of room to reduce that take-home pay and increase the 401k contribution. And when that's the case, then we're going to look for opportunities to increase it, which could be promotions, you know, annual adjustments in compensation or um, changing companies, which is usually going to involve a pay increase. We start looking for opportunities where we can increase those 401k contributions and make it super easy, you know, to where we're not um, having a an impact in their life or forcing them to make tough decisions, which we will do. You know, we'll we'll talk about tough decisions if that's a conversation that we need to have around living expenses. But a lot of times, um, you know, for tech employees, it can be that they're just so busy that they've never taken the time to look at their 401k. Yeah, I think a lot of times we, you know, we take it for granted. And, um, but what, one of the things that I'm curious about is we talk about maxing out your 401k. What determines that maximum amount? Is it like a percentage or is it a dollar amount? Or, and how does that change every, every time? Yeah, it's a dollar amount. And, um, and they're right now because of what inflation is doing, we're seeing inju- adjustments to that amount almost every year. And in you know years past, it would often adjust, but maybe it would go from like 20000 to 20500 And I think I, this is one of those kind of simple financial facts that even financial advisors have to Google every time we get the mm-hmm. question. But I think we're at $23,000 a year now, and so it's just a flat amount, and it's for everybody regardless of income. And it's also the same regardless of whether you're married or or single. It's going to be that fixed amount, and there's usually an annual increase that happens every year. Hmm. And uh, so let's say you have that maxed out, and you've done that part of of it maybe because— you took this approach like I, like I did. When you get raises, you would immediately, uh, let's say you get like a 4% raise, you would put 1%, you just increase that every year. And you know, after doing that for three or four or five years, you're going to eventually get to the point where you're maxing that out. Uh, what else should we be looking at that we, you know, 
to so that we're prepared for the future more than just the 401k. Yeah. So beyond the 401k, especially working in tech, I think that the next thing that you want to be aware of and take a look at is supplemental wages. Now, that's, that's you know, those are two words put together that we we typically don't use from day to day. And so, you know, I'm I'm referring to the actual language that's in the, the tax code when I talk about supplemental wages. So this is coming from the IRS. This is not me making up odd ways of talking about things. So supplemental wages, we're going to be talking about your annual bonus. And then um, if you're receiving the equity compensation, a lot of times those different forms of equity compensation um, become a supplemental wage. So like your restricted stock units or you know non-qualified stock options would be another example of a supplemental wage if you're in sales. You know, working in tech and sales, your commissions are going to be a supplemental wage. And the reason that's where we go next and why, you know, is it important to take a look at those is because usually those are going to be coming to you um, irregularly. You know, you're not going to be getting a supplemental wage deposited into your bank account every two weeks in the form of direct deposit. And since... They're kind of periodic, not regular. A lot of times the way that we relate to those payments is just different. And so when we're talking about what what do we want to do next, and especially talking about where do we look to save, a lot of times it's going to be those irregular income flows because most people, you know, are going to do... um, a decent job of living on their salary. So the direct deposit every other week, you know, they're, they're kind of revolving their life and around living on that amount. And so when we've got these extra amounts, you know, coming in, um, irregularly, those can be a really good opportunity to go beyond the 401k and save more money. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a, a good idea. And one of the things I know that, you know, when it comes to like planning, are, are you also planning like for your tax future as well as, as your current taxes? Because I know sometimes you, I say you're getting uh, equity grants and, you know, you cash them out, you're going to have to pay higher taxes, but maybe if you defer them for a certain amount of time, you pay less. And is there, is all that planning also going into this? Absolutely. And, um, and so kind of two things there. The first relates back to the supplemental wages. And um, so the other thing that's important about supplemental wages is the supplemental wage withholding rules. Um, And so unless your employer gives you the the, uh, choice of electing additional supplemental wage withholding, your standard withholding on bonus, RSUs, commissions, Standard withholding is going to be 22%. And a lot of times working in tech, you're going to be in a higher tax bracket than 22%. And that's 22% federal. And so a lot of our clients, you know, their marginal federal tax bracket is 32, 35, or 37. And so they've got a big underwithholding issue on all those supplemental wages. And we see this in new clients, you know, who have been accustomed to, you know, every year it's kind of the same. I usually get back a little refund. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, where did this $10,000 tax bill come from? And maybe the first time that happens, you go, oh, you know, whatever, it, you know, just pay it, be done with it. Don't worry about it. But then the next year, it's 20000 And so, you know, that keeps happening, and eventually you recognize, I don't know what's going on here, but something's wrong. And that's one of the things that we help clients address. And then the second thing about taxes is, you know, when we're working with people in tech and we talk about, you know, their financial life, I think about their financial life as having kind of three, you know, core components, which are financial planning. And so financial planning, that's all the choices that 
you know, you will make, need to make with your money. Taxes is the second one. And taxes because, you know, our our federal tax system is an income tax system. And so working in tech, you have the opportunity to earn a high income and you're going to pay very high taxes. And getting back to your question, it's not just this year. And that's one mistake a lot of people make with taxes is, you know, they just give their documents to their tax preparer, they plug it into TurboTax, and it's just like a slot machine. You know, I just put the numbers in, I pull the arm, and I see what happens. And there's a much better way to approach your taxes. And then the third kind of core component is the investment piece. So you've got your career, that's you know, where your money comes from, you got to make choices, you got to pay taxes. And eventually we want to build an investment portfolio, you know, within and without of your 401k that can replace the income that you earn in your career. Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, the the investment opportunities, like what are some of the basics? Like most of us in tech don't have a business background. We we didn't take very many finance classes, if any, at college. And we don't know a lot about what's out there. We hear about, you know, obviously we heard about Bitcoin because that's kind of a tech investment thing. But that's, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there's different there's different thoughts on that one. But uh, what should we be doing and thinking about when when we're talking about investment after we've, we've figured out that, yeah, we're owing money on taxes. So we need to, you know, maybe withhold more. Maybe we need to look at like Roth or, or something like that to, you know, reduce our taxable income or, and things like that. What, what should we be looking at exactly? Yeah. Well, the first thing that you want to do with investments is you want to avoid kind of the two big mistakes that I see a lot of people make. And the first is related to being too busy to figure it out and not having um, the right people in place to support you on investments. And so I see a lot of people in tech who don't know what to do and are super busy. And so the easiest thing is to do nothing. And, um, you know, it's not uncommon for me to see large amounts of cash that are just sitting in sweep accounts at Schwab and E-Trade from the equity comp. And they just sit there year after year because there's no plan in place and there's no kind of infrastructure built to make it really easy to move cash that's coming out of your career into your investment portfolio. That's the first big mistake. And the second one is, um, you know, kind of like you sell, you know, your equity comp and the company that you work for and then, okay, I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to invest it. Mm -hmm. Let me buy... 10 big tech stocks. And so to me, that's not much different than holding, you know, the one tech stock at the company that you're already working for. And then maybe you don't do that. Maybe you've heard, you know, that the S&P 500, like that's where it's at. And so I see a lot of people now who um, I'll just buy the S&P 500, which is better than 10 big tech stocks, but it's still just 500 of the largest U.S. stocks and you're missing out on big parts of the global stock market. So, you know, where to start is you want to make sure that your investment portfolio is built around kind of the way that your life functions. So how much cash should we be keeping? What's an appropriate emergency reserve? And then building a portfolio beyond that, a long-term portfolio that's typically going to be mutual funds and ETFs with low expenses that's built around your career. So we're not going to be, you know, investing, selling one tech stock to invest in other tech stocks. I want your investment portfolio to function a little bit different than your career as a whole. And I want it to be really, really well diversified. Mm. So uh, let me ask you real quick when it comes to, you you know, investing, um, should we, like if we had that lump sum of cash, uh, should we work on paying off debts first before investing? Or is it good to have, you know, manageable debts as well? Because some people will say, you know, I've talked to friends and like, oh, before I start investing, I'm going to pay off my house. 
Um, is that a good move or is it a better move to maybe invest first and then work on the house later? Well, right now where interest rates are, if you've got a 30 year fixed rate mortgage at 4% or less, please, please do not (laughs) dump a bunch of cash into paying off that mortgage early. And so, um, you know, so to answer your question, it's a, it's an individual situation. Sometimes like student loans, if you've got private student loans, you know, that have high interest rates, sometimes we can look at the math and say, yeah, absolutely. You know, you're getting, you know, a, a good return by paying off those early and saving future interest. Um, and then in other cases, you know, the, the reverse is true. Interest rates low. The payment's not a problem in your life. Um, and then just kind of knowing yourself, too. Like, if I pay this debt off and it's gone, mm-hmm. what am I going to do with those monthly payments that I'm making right now? Am I just going to spend that money? You know, and if that's the case, then maybe we're better off taking the cash that you've got right now that you're not spending, especially like if it's a, you know, a larger sum of cash from a bonus or something and plugging it into an investment portfolio. Because a lot of times like they're, you know, some of us, we like if it's sitting in the bank account or it's coming in my paycheck, it's getting spent. But if it's in the investment portfolio, I don't touch it. And um, and so that's a big part of kind of my job at, as an advisor working with individuals is knowing them and figuring out like, you know, what I feel like. And it's a collaborative process. You know, we talk about this stuff, but figuring out like what's going to work best for you and then, you know, taking that course of of action. So there's no, you know, simple answer there. The other thing that I tell people about paying off debt, too, is, you know, like on the mortgage piece, Mm -hmm. I typically, you know, take the approach of invest, don't pay off your mortgage early. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I do that is, especially now, you know, the cost to replace that mortgage would be really high if you got your mortgage prior to 2022. But then also, like, if you pay off your, if you dump a bunch of money into your mortgage, unless you're paying it off completely, nothing changes for you financially. That next month's payment is still going to be due. Right. Now, having said all that, I always tell everyone, this is kind of the way I think about it. This is how I like to approach it. But if you've got strong feelings about your mortgage, you know, then we can put together a plan for paying the mortgage off and kind of adapt the rest of the plan around, you know, accomplishing that goal. Yeah, I'm guessing in most cases you're going to make more interest uh, than you would spend for the mortgage pay. Like if you had 50 grand, instead of dumping 50 grand to just reduce the interest that you would be paying, you know, or or pay your mortgage off early, you're going to make more than your interest rate investing most of the time. Yeah, I agree. And the other kind of thing related to paying, you know, paying off debts early versus investing is, you know, I think that uh, if we if we take kind of all the different financial things that we can do in life and we just group Mm -hmm. them into two categories and the two categories are going to be built around the question, am I playing defense or am I playing offense? And You know, uh, some of us, we tend to be conservative, risk averse, um, and we don't like having something like a mortgage. And so, um, you know, if that's you, then you want to be really good at playing defense. And so, like, my parents are really good at playing defense. They make very different financial decisions than the ones that I make. Of course, you know, they... Like, I'm a product of the choices that they made, um, Mm -hmm. you know, in that it was go to college, you know, get a good career, have opportunities that we never had before. And so that gave me the opportunity now to play offense, whereas for them, like, 
you know, it probably was the right choice to be really good at playing defense, but they've had a paid for house for probably, you know, the last 20 years and they would never, ever think about going back. And, you know, I could explain, you know, a few years ago, I could say, hey, 3%, you know, interest rates on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage investing at, eight nine ten percent a year like they would understand that and agree with me but they would never do it because for them that's not the approach that they take to their life and their money and there's nothing wrong with that so you want to you want to do a good job of kind of knowing yourself and knowing like what's the combination of strategies that kind of really line up with my philosophy for money that I can execute consistently and really believe in and really stick with because it is that kind of those little things that you're doing consistency consistently over the long term you know that are going to be um you know the difference between really really successful when it comes to money or constantly having problems pop up and a lot of times you're not going to know like you're there's always going to be this specific problem that you're trying to solve and how did this happen why did why does this keep coming up why do these things keep happening to me and we all have bad luck from time to time but a lot of times those situations can come out of you know not having like a clear consistent strategy that you're executing on throughout your career yeah, yeah, for sure. I think consistency is kind of one of those key words you mentioned that uh, a lot of us struggle with sometimes. You know, we'll, we'll have this uh, mindset we're gonna we're gonna get this straightened out, and you know, and maybe for a month or two we'll we'll work at it. But what are some tips you have to help people be more consistent? Yeah. So, um, you know, as as an advisor, and you know, as my client's advisor, you know, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna look for easy things that we can set up that don't require consistency. And what I mean by that is like, I can do this for you or I can get you to do it in five minutes and it's going to make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference over your, your lifetime. So we're always looking for that kind of stuff. And then beyond that, you know, uh, kind of one big picture thing and then one detailed thing. So the big picture thing is you want to be consistent, but you also want to recognize how money is changing for you throughout your career. And what I mean by that is, you know, we can all kind of think back to early in our career, you know, those first few jobs, the income that we made then, and kind of the way life worked when it was all about that paycheck because the paycheck was all that we had. We had no money. And so direct deposit lands, this is what I got for the next two weeks and I got to make it work. At some point in time, though, you start to move from not having money to now having money, you know, where your net worth starts to become a multiple of your annual income. And so you want to remain consistent with who you are, but you also want to recognize that some of the things that were important in the past when you didn't have money are less important now. Here's what I mean. Give you an example of what I mean by that. And this example comes from, you know, a client in tech. We were having our, our annual meeting and they've, you know, bought, they're not their starter home, but now they're kind of second forever home. They've got, you know, their first kid. Um, and so, you know, they're at a point in life where they're super busy and things are changing really fast and stuff can start to feel kind of out of control because there's just so many things that you have to think about and do from day to day. And so he was telling me, you know, he said, uh, I got to kind of feeling bad about the amount of money that we're spending on takeout. And um, he said, you know, I looked at it and I feel like if we worked really hard, we could cut like $200 a month off of that takeout expense. Mm -hmm. 
he goes, but, but then I looked at our investment portfolio and, you know, one good day in the stock market is worth tens of thousands of dollars to us. So he's like, am I going to like, you know, what am I going to focus on? You know, $200 a month on takeout, or am I going to focus on my investment portfolio? And so a big thing that I help clients with is that transition from when your paycheck is the main thing to when your balance sheet and your net worth is the main thing. So that's kind of the the big picture. And then the granular is, you know, I'm a big fan of, of YNAB, of You Need a Budget. I've used it personally for um, 10 years now, and it's made a huge difference to me. And so if you want to talk about that consistent daily habit, if you can just get in the habit of using YNAB to where if we need to take a look at your living expenses, you can accurately tell me what those living expenses are, that'll make a huge difference. And what is that tool you're talking about? So it's YNAB. It stands for you need a budget. Okay. Yep. And um, I love it. Um you know, my my wife and I, we use it consistently. And any time I have a client who needs to figure out where the money is going or is expressing frustration to me over, I feel like I should be saving more. I don't know where my money's going. Um, I just can't figure this out. And they're showing me their, you know, their budgets in Google Sheets. And, and then they're showing me, you know, their credit card statements, and it's like, none of this makes sense. Uh, YNAB is where we go. Um, the thing that I tell them is you're going to hate it at first because um, it's going to be different. You know, uh, a lot of people, when they think about budgeting tools, they go back to Mint, which is now gone. Yeah. Um, and, um, and Mint, the whole promise of Mint was we'll make it easy. You know, we'll import the transactions you categorize and kind of train the tool to know, you know, okay, if I'm spending money at Target, this is the category that it goes in. But the problem with Mint was, is it's like I sit down at the beginning of the month and I create my budget. And then at the end of the month, I just see all the ways that I was completely wrong. <laughs> and and it never matches up. And so YNAB has an approach built into you know, a software tool that kind of helps you maintain that awareness around, I get paid today. What do I need that money to do for me before I get paid again? And then, you know, where is the money going throughout the month? Yeah, I guess that's a, um, I, I'm so I've never heard of this tool. I'm just looking at it right now. I guess that's a really good tool for people that were using mint that want to move over because like you said mint kind of went away and um the credit karma replacement isn't quite uh, a budgeting tool now there was the credit karma replacement and then um you know true bill was another tool that i liked because they made it really easy to find the um the subscriptions that you had forgotten about and they've now been bought out Truebill has by Rocket Money. Um, but yeah, YNAB is kind of, you know, there's YNAB and then there's uh, Dave Ramsey's Every Dollar. And I've never used Every Dollar before, but I know that there are some similarities between Every Dollar and YNAB. But YNAB, you know, has been huge for me personally. And then I've seen it you know, make a big difference for, for a lot of clients. You just have to be willing to put in the time, um, because it's, it takes up a lot of time at first and it, it feels awkward because you're going to have to think about everything that you're doing as you learn how to use it. But if you stick with it, you know, for a few months, um, you kind of learn like how to make it work for you and how to fit it into your life. And then it moves from being this thing that I really have to work at and it's frustrating. And every time I use it, I have to think about what I'm doing to now, you know, for my wife and I, like you just log the transactions 
I log the transactions, she logs her transactions. And then whenever, you know, we have our income coming in, I go in and, and I assign all of those dollars to the different categories. And then she does, you know, like a weekly update, just making sure, you know, anything that hasn't been categorized has and, and just kind of matching everything up. And it's been super helpful. And especially like when we sold our first house and bought our second, like that transition where everything that was normal about the month kind of gets turned upside down and you've got this, you know, period of the move and extra expenses and then kind of settling into a new normal month in a in a new house. I mean, it just, you know, you can so easily see where the money's going and how you're kind of adapting to all the things that are changing. Um, because for most people, uh, probably 80, 90 percent of the population, the default when it comes to money is is spending it. And that's not, you know, like there's no no shame or judgment there. It's just kind of like living in a consumer economy. We make it really easy to spend money. And so um, for most people, like if we don't find a way to either capture it on the front end, like straight out of your paycheck and get it out of sight, out of mind, or on the back end, once it's in the bank account to build the awareness, it's, it's going to get spent. And, you know, working in tech, you're always at risk of, you know, of, of losing your job. And, um, and that's kind of the, the short-term fear that you're always dealing with. But then the longer term is, you know, I have a lot of tech employees express to me, you know, I, I'm especially in their 30s. 30s are tough. I, I'm not sure how long I can keep this up, I, how long I can keep going at this pace, working the way that I am. And so the longer term risk is like we don't turn that career and that income into an investment portfolio and you just stay locked into have to i have to keep doing this i have to keep working the way that i am and you never get to the point of using the opportunities that you have in your career to create you know freedom and that's that's the whole goal of the financial plan um, is to create financial freedom. And a lot of times what that looks like is, you know, clients who have gotten there and they'll start to ask questions that usually take the form of what if, you know, what if I do this? And it's going to be some form of higher expenses, spending money on something they really enjoy or lower income, work mm -hmm. intentionally working less. And usually by the time they get there and they ask those questions, it's like, okay, what if you do that? You know, you've, you've done it. Like the freedom is here unless you turn into, you know, MC Hammer or Evander Holyfield, like dramatically change who you are into someone completely different and blow it all. You know, these little adjustments that you're wanting to make to make life more fun are not going to matter. You've, You've kind of done the hard work and now, you know, we get to have fun conversations about the things that you want to do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, it, you know, when we get to that point where we're, you know, we're making more money than probably we thought we were when we were in college um, and we are investing, it's one of those things where like sometimes we have that desire to, you know, change our lifestyle. But I think most people are in a pattern by that point and they're just going to live the way that they live and if they make more money that's great hopefully they can use it for investment maybe an early retirement or or something like that or planning for their kids colleges yeah absolutely you're definitely locked into a pattern and and that's a good thing and so that kind of relates back to the consistency that we talked about earlier you know being who you are um and not saying oh i've got this money now and, you know, and wanting to completely change 
like who you are. And so for, you know, clients who get there, it does take the form of small adjustments through the years. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, and I know in my life, I'm sure in your life, you know, if we look back, we could see, you know, those small adjustments. Sometimes it could be changing, you know, the restaurant that you, you know, most like to eat at, you know, to one that's just a little bit better food and a little more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, changing, you know, the brands that, that you like to, um, to purchase from, you know, one that's a little better quality, a little more expensive. And, um, and then, you know, I get to see a lot of really cool stories, you know, of, of clients who, you know, have done this, um, you know, whether it's buying, you know, a second home to be, have a place to stay when you go to visit family. And then, you know, we've got kind of this cool thing going on where it's both like an investment, it's appreciating, but it's also allowing you to, you know, do something that you enjoy or, you know, it could be like you really love in endurance racing, you know, that's your thing. And so, um, you know, in the past you tried to keep it local, but now you've got the ability to travel and go to these cool destinations, um, and to do it more often than you would have thought possible in the past. And every year we're going to talk about what you're doing. Um, we're going to check in and make sure that it's okay. And usually it is. And I'm going to tell you, Hey, don't worry about it. You know, this is really cool. Keep going. And here's why you're going to be okay. Because, you're maxing out your 401k still, you know, you've got this great investment portfolio that you're not touching still. And, um, and you can kind of keep living, you know, the life that you enjoy. Um, and that's getting there. Like, it's hard to explain to people what that feels like until you get there. But as someone who gets to observe it, like it's very much worth the effort that you put into, kind of the plan along the way yeah and so for tech employees it's the busyness you know like you just get so busy that you're not making time to plan for yourself yeah and we do definitely get busy that's for sure um well it's been a great conversation how can people learn more about you know planning for their future especially if they have any questions and they want to get some help um how can they reach out to you and connect and uh and, and make that conversation yeah absolutely so kbfinancialadvisors.com and uh, so we've got a very active blog there where we write about the kinds of questions that our clients ask you'll also find it super easy on our website kbfinancialadvisors.com to get access to our calendar and to schedule um, a 30-minute call just to give us a chance to learn more about you and see if working together is a great fit all right, sounds good. I'll link that in the show notes too at geekleader.com so people can click through and get to your website and connect with you there. Um, Landon, again, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate the knowledge you've shared with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please go to geekleader.com to learn more about what this guest is up to, click on their links, and connect with them online. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Make sure you've subscribed if you haven't already. And if you feel so inclined, you can leave me a tip by going to geekleader.com slash tip.